1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, page 1051. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want you to just spend a moment thinking about your favourite saying. What's your favourite saying? Uh, My favourite saying is one that I've learnt since I was a little child living on the coast. Pink at night, sailor's delight. Pink in the morning, sailor's warning. Now, if you've grown up on the inland, you might not have sailor, you might have shepherd. Uh, If you're closer to the coast, you might have surfer, who knows? Pink at night, sailor's delight. Pink in the morning, sailor's warning. I, I actually use that probably every day at least in my mind. I love it because it's memorable on so many levels. Uh, It rhymes, so even a slow coach like me can remember it. Uh, It deals with the real world and real moments, and it helps me with the daily occurrence, what's the weather going to be like today? And then this week I got really excited because I was listening to an interview with a weather person on the ABC And they said that of all the sayings we use, this is the most reliable and truthful. And then they explained it to do with clouds and fractions and all that kind of stuff. I didn't understand that. Just pink in the morning, sailor's delight. Pink at at night, sailor's delight. Pink in the morning, sailor's warning. It's true. It works. We've all got sayings like that, haven't we? Uh, They might be long sayings. They might be short sayings. But sayings are helpful because they summarise truth, don't they? Sayings are helpful because they summarise truth. They simplify complex ideas and they can be easily remembered. They can even be as simple as an apple a day keeps the doctor away or a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Yeah, we've all got them, haven't we? Uh, But sayings aren't just part of our wider world. Sayings also exist within God's mob and right from the earliest days. And we're going to look at one today from the first 30 years of God's people and it summarises everything we're about here at Narrabri Anglican Church. Let me pray and we're going to look at it together. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that you speak to us. Thank you that you use language we understand. And thank you that you speak to our deepest need. In Jesus' name, amen. Is that working? Next slide. Beautiful. That's the saying. Paul's writing to his close friend. He's got a mate called Timothy. He's a protege. Uh, Paul has left Timothy in a town called Ephesus. If you're thinking today, that's modern-day Turkey. Uh, Timothy's got a job there. Uh, His job there is to get God's mob settled and to understand God's plan. Uh, Paul's writing around 56 57 AD. So we're less than 25 years after the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Timothy has got one job to hold on to, the glorious gospel of God and what it looks like amongst God's people. Put simply, the most significant good news ever for the whole world from God. Paul is a servant of that good news. His job, as we heard earlier on, is to go around and tell everyone he meets about that. He's actually heard that good news and it's completely changed his life. We we heard about that from Acts 9, didn't we? From the bloke called Saul. That's actually Paul. We'll come to him in a moment and see how it changed his life. How does Paul summarise the most significant good news ever for the world from God? There it is again. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst of them. Next slide, please. The good news is about a person. It's about a person called Christ Jesus. Now, before we go any further, let's clarify what that means. His name is Jesus. His job is Christ. His name is Jesus. His job is Christ. As soon as you say that, you have a whole wider picture to put him in context. Uh, Let let me give you a name. Her name is Kate. You know lots of Kates, don't you? She's a princess. You now know which Kate I'm talking about, don't you? His name is Jesus. 
His title is Christ. You know which Jesus I'm talking about. The context is the whole of world history. It's a job description given by God to the one he said he was going to send to fix up the broken world. It was a promise that God had made to his mob called Israel and he said that someone from your group is going to come into the world and fix it up. And this saying tells us that Jesus is that man. The good news, the saying, is about a person, but it's also about an event. Next slide, please. This Christ Jesus came into the world. Now, at the very least, we've got to understand that this means Jesus was born. Jesus is a real human being. Jesus lived and breathed. Jesus walked and talked. Jesus had dirty toenails. Jesus slept and showered. Jesus had a mother and a father. Jesus had a trade. He worked as a carpenter for at least 18 years. He had calluses and he got worn out. Whatever else you want to say about this Jesus, he was a real human being like you and me. But there's also an implication there that because he ended the world, he's something more than human, isn't he? He actually had to come into our world. And the Bible is very clear that this Jesus is not just fully human, he's also fully God. He's the son of God who took on flesh to come into our world to be one of us and to be with us. This good news is about a person. It's about an event. Next slide, please. And it's about a specific action. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. Now, if you pause and think about that, there are a lot of big consequences in those few words, aren't there? To save sinners. The good news states very clearly that there are sinners in the world, and we all know them, don't we? And they need saving. Well, who are the sinners? Who are the sinners in the world? Well, put simply... Sinners are not those people. Sinners are us people. We are sinners. All humans are sinners. In fact, the bloke who wrote this letter, Paul, describes it like this elsewhere. Next slide, please. In a letter he wrote to God's people in Rome, as it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Together they've become useless. There's no one who does good Not even one. Sinners aren't those people over there. Sinners are us people here. And the definition of sin is very simple. If you've been to church before, you would have heard me say it. Just like the word, it has I in the middle. It's the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. Now, for some of us, that can be quite aggressive, can't it? That can be an attitude that's angry at God and angry at other people. And we've got a name for that. They're they're the bad people, aren't they? For others of us, that might be apathy. Why would I care about such things when today is so wonderful? And for some of us, that might be hidden behind what it looks like as Jade picked up to be a really good person who's got a satisfactory life. Paul was someone like that who looked like he had it all together on the outside, but regardless of which of those three you fall into, we all suffer the same problem. We all want to be God instead of God. And it's this sin we need saving from. Everywhere you look, there are consequences, aren't there? It's in our own lives. When we see what it looks like to play being God in our own relationships, our own decisions and our own households. Even when it looks like we've got it together on the surface, we recognise that we're pretty broken on the inside, aren't we? And we struggle with brokenness. The consequences are in our world. I have a favourite question I ask every scripture class and everyone says the same thing. How's the world going? It's broken, Mr Gabbett. And we all know that, don't we? It's the consequence of having eight billion gods wanting to rule it all at the same time. And the consequence is in our own futures, isn't it? 
You see, God is remarkably fair. In his judgment for us, he gives us what we want. If we want life without him, then God says, you can have it and you can have it forever. It's not apathy on God's part. It's not a shoulder shrug, but it's his active judgment giving us what we desire, life without him, now and forever. And we've got a word for that too, don't we? The word's death, and it comes to all of us. Now, when we understand this reality about sin and about being sinners, we then understand why it's so important to have someone come into the world to save us. We need saving. It happens every time someone faces death because you can do nothing about it on your own, can you? You'll never beat it when you come face to face with it. That's why we need someone to come to save us. That's why the coming of Jesus starts to make sense. He didn't come just to be a good man. He was certainly that. He didn't come to bring about social change, though his influence is still here, isn't it? Look at us gathered. He didn't come to bring deep and meaningful teaching and wisdom. His words are the most impressive in history. He didn't come to be a good example, though he's certainly worth following. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he did it very simply. He lived the life we couldn't, having God as God. He died the death we deserved, taking all of God's judgment on himself, and then he rose from the dead to show that he'd beaten it for us. It's that simple. Jesus lived the life we couldn't so that he could die the death we deserved and he rose from the dead so that we could be saved. And when Jesus did that, he dealt with our eternal death, the forever consequences of our sin before God. He took what we deserved so we could get what we don't deserve. Why? Because he loves us because he's merciful and gracious and kind. At the very moment we want to be God, Jesus came to save us. Now, you always have to work out what to do with sayings. I'm at point three on the outline. And that's why I love pink in the morning, because it allows me to make a decision every day based on what actually works. It's worth holding on to that saying. I'm at the next slide, please. Uh, Paul himself regards this saying as worth holding on to. Do you you see how he describes it there? This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Paul knew that personally. He looked like he had it all together. He'd been to the best schools. He'd had the best university education. He was the bloke who never missed going to synagogue on a Sunday or a Saturday. He always did the right thing with the poor, He was diligent in his work. No one had a family tree or educational history that could compare to his. No one was more impressive than Paul. And yet how does he describe himself? The worst of sinners. And his life bore testimony to that. I I hope you are listening as Pat read there in Acts chapter 9. Did you see what his heart led him to do in Acts 9? His heart led him to pursue Christians to persecute them. He was an arrogant man, a persecutor. He definitely needed saving and he met Jesus. And the transformation was amazing. He was a living, breathing, eating, talking example of what Jesus can do. Persecutor to proclaimer, killer to Christian, someone saved from his sins. And and you notice how it came about? Full acceptance of the truth. Taking what Jesus had said and done and was and believing in it. And it completely transformed his life. Paul knew that personally, but he also knew it objectively. You could actually go back in history and test every part of that saying. Was there a bloke called Jesus? You could look up the birth records in Bethlehem. 
Was there a bloke called Jesus? You could look up the TAFE records in Jerusalem to see that he trained as a carpenter. Jesus really was a man. And even at his trial, the Romans noted that he had no charge to justify his death. He really was perfect. He did die. And you know, the tomb's still empty. You can test every historical fact there. You can also test every historical fact with those humans. What do we know about us humans? Well, we all die, don't we? Which means we're all sinners. None of us can beat death on our own and we need saving. You see, all the facts check out, not just in Paul personally, but in the saying objectively. And this saying is a summary of who we are here at Narrabri Anglican Church. I'm at the last point on the outline. We're sinners. We're sinners who've been saved by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. We know that this is what God has planned and promised. We know that we don't deserve it, do we? It's God's merciful gift. Uh, We're serious about this truth. We love it. It gives us great joy. And it changes who we are. We're so excited about this, as you heard from Dan, that we want to tell the whole world about it because it can save any sinner and there's no other way for them to be saved. Pink in the morning, well, when I was younger, that helped me work out whether it was worth going for a surf or at least whether I was going to wear long pants. It's a saying worth holding on to. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Well, that's a saying that reminds me of who I am, what I need, and it completely changes my whole life. Isn't that a saying worth considering and accepting? We would love it if you would want to know more about that saying. We would love it if you want to keep joining us each Sunday. We would love it if you wanted to meet with one of us, perhaps the person who invited you to come along today, to learn more about what this is all about. This is what we're about at Narrabri Anglican Church. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for its truth. Thank you for its goodness. Thank you for this saying, a saying that's emerged within three decades of Jesus that summarises the truth that you have proclaimed to the world, the most significant good news, that your son Jesus came into the world to save people like us. Father, thank you for this good news. In Jesus' name, amen.